for today comes from the Gospel of John. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, throughout nearly 20 years of ministry, I have been approached many times by people, Christians, who are struggling to understand the relationship between Christianity and other faiths. Oftentimes, the struggle is quite personal in nature, which is why they, they come. Either they've met someone um, and, who is Buddhist or Hindu or Taoist or Muslim or Jew who, who they've gotten to know more deeply than um, before, and they've, that person has struck them as being deeply spiritual and connected with God in ways they see reflected in Christianity's connection with God, maybe even more so, and they wonder, as they've been taught that Christianity is the only way, uh, and apart from whom there is no other. Others um, have not only met one of these people, but they've fallen in love with them, and they're even, some are even considering marriage and wondering what the implications of marrying a non-Christian may be. Others, uh, that Buddhist or Hindu may be their son-in-law or daughter-in-law, which is what provokes the question. And for still others, that Buddhist or Hindu or Taoist may be their own son or daughter. Such was the case uh, for John, uh, Don, uh, a person I, I write about in the Phoenix Affirmations book uh, who came to me years ago troubled by the actions of his 18-year-old daughter, Carrie. You see, Carrie had uh, uh, decided on her 18th birthday uh, to announce to the family, a good Bible church-going family, uh, that she was converting to Buddhism. And this put a rather chilling effect on, on the celebration. Uh, the over the coming weeks and months, the, the parents uh, tried to persuade uh, Carrie to come back to the fold. Uh, grandparents got involved, even aunts and uncles, uh, very disturbed about uh, Carrie's uh, uh, conversion, and uh, therefore, um, Finally, um, after every attempt seemed to create a larger rift between Carrie and the family, not a smaller one, uh, Don sought the counsel of his pastor um, who per suggested that Don, after hearing you know, what had gone on, um, that Don and his wife consider disowning um, their, their daughter, um, disowning the daughter, um, and at least with the threat um, and being prepared to, to follow through on that if, if she did not uh, kind of turn from uh, following uh, the Buddha and, and, ret and repent and come back to the Christian fold. The rationale um, had to do with compassion um, within his um, and their uh, belief system. Within their belief system, if Carrie died, uh, a Buddhist, she would be tortured in hell for eternity. And so why wouldn't they take extreme measures? And uh, the, the point about disowning Carrie had to do with the fact that they also had two other teenage children who were younger, and Carrie had a lot of influence on them, and the, the, they were worried, the pastor was worried that, that she might then turn them or show that it's okay to simply follow whatever path, and that would put them in danger as well. So while he wasn't a member of 
my church. He had heard from a friend about a year earlier that I'd held a, a, a Bible study that looked at the relationship between Jesus' Beatitudes the sermon, from the Sermon on the Mount and certain Zen stories called cones or quans. And uh, while when he heard that news uh, a year earlier, he'd seen that as further evidence of the decline of Christianity in America and, the, and, and, and moving into um, religious and spiritual relativism, uh, now he was curious. And so he came to my office uh, asking uh, after what on earth, <laughs> you know, how, how, what was he, could he do with his daughter? Before he ever even sat down, though, you know, he was saying, so you seem to believe that any faith uh, will do. Don't you know the, the, the line from Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. You know, you know, the question sounded a bit more like a statement than a question, uh, but a statement supported not by the surety of belief, but more by the force with which it is said. Um, Don you know, then sat down in, in the chair opposite me, and with his eyes lowered, he said, I have very personal reasons you know, for knowing uh, hearing this, your perspective on this, and he just proceeded to describe uh, Carrie's uh, situation. You know. uh, can he, a, a Buddhist, you know, find God and go to heaven, he asked. You know. you know, beneath that question was also the question, you know, will my daughter be tortured for eternity? <laughs> will she lose her salvation if she continues in this path? You know. How would you have advised Don? if he were coming to you for advice? Have you found anything in this series um, to suggest uh, a way of engaging with that? Um, how would you approach him on a human level? Well, in March, this little guy came into our household. This last March, uh, his name is Ro. Uh, he came into our household just a few days before our Doberman Kita died of cancer, actually. Um, just was found stray on the street, and, and we went through the process, and Roe has made our transition into Doberman-less household uh, a lot easier, though we miss Kita uh, tremendously. Uh, Roe is named Roe because Kita is named after a species of salmon, so it only seemed appropriate. <laughs> Roe. And uh, while Roe lacks the um, intimidation factor that uh, an intruder surely would find if, if they entered our, our, our house uh, and found a Doberman there, uh, what Roe lacks in intimidation, he more than makes up for in, in cuteness. Um, and, and, and actually, anybody of you who know Kita also know that if you were an intruder, all it would take would be a, a warm smile and an outstretched hand, and you would be Kita's new best friend, no matter what your intentions were. Ro is actually probably more uh, dangerous to the intruder than Kita ever was. Uh, not that Ro is less loving, but he does seem to be more discerning. Um, uh, Ro has actually been a, a perfect dog in, in, in every respect but one. So. Oh, you want to know what... One that, that is, well, Roe is, is, he's half uh, Bichon and half uh, Jack Russell Terrier, and uh, that, that Jack Russell blood in him means that Roe is a born ratter, ratter. That means that he can dig ferociously and squeeze himself into spaces that are a little bigger than your fist, which also meant that he could easily get out from under the six-inch gap in our fence that, that, that's along the alley of our, of our house. So uh, from day one, I found myself running down to Menards and buying you know, stones and you know, big pavers and putting them underneath that, that gap and then making a pronouncement to Melanie, there's no way he's getting out now, only to open up the garage door to go on my way to work and discover before I'd even opened the garage door, he was already out <laughs> there. Well, after six runs to Menards, <laughs> six pronouncements, and six humiliations, um, I finally uh, went down to the, the, the Pet Smart on 72nd uh, Street where uh, Vern Kramer is the manager or congregation member and bought myself a, or bought Roe, a pet safe invisible fence. And I strung about 200 feet of wire there and back, uh, hooked it up, and, uh, you know, while that shot, I put on the, the, 
they call it a receiver collar. <laughs> well, that receiver collar only administers a shock that is no greater than if you were to rub your feet on the carpet you know, with socks. Uh, all it took were two incidences, and Roe came to love the boundaries. <laughs> Changed his behavior amazingly. What I didn't realize was the, having the shock collar on for a period of time would also make turn Roe into a shock collar lover. Uh, I learned this the, actually the other day when uh, after three months of wearing this, this collar around his neck, I, I was giving him a, a bath. So I took off the, first I took off the collar and he got very nervous and he didn't know the bath was approaching so it wasn't that. Uh, and then after the bath, um, I uh, took his collar up again and, and shook it and he just ran to me from clear across the room, sat down, was anxiously waiting for me to put that shock collar you know, back on his neck. I think human beings are a lot like dogs in, in that respect. Uh, once we grow familiar with something, uh, even if it confines us, we grow to depend upon that and even to, to um, feel like we, we need that. Uh, in the, the words of, of uh, Morgan Friedman's character, Red, in the Shaw, Shawshank Redemption, he said you know, about prison life, these walls are funny. First, you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes, you get so you depend on them. That's institutionalized. I think sometimes religion um, acts that way too, putting the theological equivalent of a shot collar um, around our necks and drawing boundaries that are clearly defined and, and rigidly defined uh, with the implication that if we were, are to, if we're to cross those boundaries in any way, um, we'll get zapped. You know, of course, the biggest zap that has been within our tradition is this threat of if you don't please this God, if you cross these boundaries, uh, you may just be tortured for eternity in a, in a fiery lake. That's not just a, the theological equivalent of a shock collar. That's a shock and awe collar. You know? And so many learn um, to stay well away from the boundaries, you know, not even to question them, lest there be any danger of, 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 of crossing them. They learned also to, to love and defend those very boundaries. After all, it takes the compassion within us and turns it into a defensive mechanism. Don't cross here. I have compassion. You know, you may you may wind up in a, in a place you don't want to be. And so we, as time passes and this belief becomes more familiar, we grow more and more to accept that as simply a belief within our tradition that's legitimate and, and valued and, and so forth. And without ever asking ourselves, well, is that an appropriate um, response to boundary crossing in our tradition? When Don came to me and we, we had a great, um, long uh, conversation, uh, and what did we talk about? Well, we talked about boundaries, and not what his church said about boundaries, and not what I thought about boundaries, but what Jesus said about boundaries. And what Jesus said about boundaries uh, was found uh, in and around our Scripture reading uh, this morning. He talks about uh, shepherds and sheep. He talks about uh, sheepfolds and gates when he talks about boundaries. Uh, boundaries. You know, the purpose of, of a sheepfold is, which Jesus names, is to protect the sheep against thieves and robbers and who care nothing for the sheep and only for themselves, and to protect the sheep against wolves who will come and ravage uh, the flock. That's why you have fences. That's why you have boundaries. So, boundaries uh, in religion are, serve an appropriate uh, and healthy uh, purpose. It's not that religion should have no boundaries. Uh, but many seem to have transferred this belief to, into suggesting that the purpose for the sheepfold is not to protect against robbers and thieves or wolves, but from God. From God. As if, if a sheep gets out, the, the good shepherd himself will, will, will come and attack like a wolf. Worse, even. Is that the kind of faith that Jesus came and lived and died for? 
When Jesus talked about sheep straying from the fold, he had some clear things to say about that too, you know, as the good shepherd. You know, that the, as a, a good shepherd will leave the 99 you know, who are safely protected and go searching for that one uh, lost sheep. And he says, I am the good shepherd, even uh, I lay down my life on behalf of that sheep. You know, a, shep a sheep is only lost and in danger when that sheep has strayed from the fold and is out in the open pasture lands where the, the thieves and robbers and, and, and wolves can have their way as they please. They're not under the guardianship of, of the, the shepherd. And in those cases, that's when Jesus says, I go and I find the lost. I go and if they're confronted with the, sh the wolves, and I will even lay down my life on behalf of the sheep. But if the shepherd, if the sheep finds its way to another fold, to another enclosure, well, that's another question. Jesus says in our Scripture passage, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. They recognize the sound of my voice and they respond to it. Some people hear in those lines, and he says, when he says that, when he, that he will call to them, they'll become one flock, one shepherd, the call to convert uh, non-Christians to Christianity. But Jesus is talking about sheep that he already has, who all, he already shepherds, who already hear his voice and already respond to that voice. Looking back on it, um, we spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time with Don talking about theology and, and the Bible, uh, but now after 10 additional years of pastoral experience and reflecting upon uh, the incarnational quality of God's love and, and the cross, um, I would have liked to have asked uh, Don um, other things, some more questions. You know, for instance, um, what, did they, did they ever sit down with Carrie? and actually try to understand her spiritual life, what was motivating her to leave uh, the fold that she had been born within and, and go to another. In my experience, I found that most people who switch religions um, are not spiritually stagnant. In fact, far from it. They're spiritually in motion. They're searching for something, and they're searching actively for, for it. What was Carrie searching for? What was she searching for that she wasn't finding within her own fold, uh, be that for real reasons or imagined ones? What was she seeking to find uh, that she had not where she was? There are certain things the soul knows because it's a creature of God, because it was created within God's love and grace, or in the Gospel of John, uh, as the Gospel of John attests, because all things were created through this amazing love, the Word of God. All things are connected. So there are certain things the soul knows intrinsically. For instance that we are truly loved beyond what our hearts and minds can possibly fathom. The soul knows this. Our hearts and minds don't oftentimes. The soul knows that it's constantly surrounded by the presence of this loving Creator. The soul knows that this loving Creator privileges relationship over rules, wants above everything else, to be in relationship with us. Despite whatever we've done, despite whatever we've left undone, so therefore the soul also knows something about grace, that this, this love comes to us because, not because of our goodness, but because of God's goodness. We don't build a bridge to God. We can't get there. That God has built a bridge to us. It knows that. And so if it doesn't find that within its setting, it gets very disturbed underneath, and our hearts and minds become anxious. We begin to search and wonder. Uh, and sometimes we break down into depression. You know, I wonder what Carrie was searching for. Was she responding you know, to that sensibility, seeking for it? Did she find it in her setting? Is, would she find it in Buddhism? I told Don that, you know, we can't know whether Buddhism is one of those flocks that Jesus says you know, are his own uh, that is other than Christianity. Uh, and Carrie can't know until she 
experiences life within that, that flock. But it, if it is an experience of that love and grace, a searching in response to that love and grace that she is following, and if she finds it in that place, we can trust that for that time, you know, that she is still connected to the Good Shepherd. But I also mentioned that, you know, she may find her way back you know, to the fold that she was raised in. But the way she's going to find her way back is not by being condemned by them, but by offering the kind of love that Christians within our fold are taught to offer, a love that is cross-shaped, a love revealed in the cross that tells us that the kind of love we are to offer is love that never gives up on you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've left undone that would sooner die than punish, that privileges relationship and transformation over rule-keeping and perfection. If they would keep offering this cross-shaped love to carry, uh, she may just find uh, that as she travels to the other fold that the grass looked a lot greener when she was looking from the outside in than when it was inside. And she may come to find herself back in this one. I am the good shepherd. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. They hear my voice, says Jesus, and they respond to it. If we as Christians will continue to cling to that cross-shaped love that forms the gate of our fold. Uh, the deeper we travel into this journey as Christian sheep, the more we come to understand that Jesus is truly the good shepherd who shepherds one flock ultimately and one fold. Amen.